good to see so many of you turn up, and I understand why. Because Michael Henderson, one of our favourites in the faculty, is a draw card. There's no doubt about it. Now, I can tell you quietly that Michael's not very competitive. He just wanted to make sure that he drew more people to his Dean's lecture than the Dean ever had. <laughs> well, that wasn't very hard because at my lecture I had the front row, so he's already doing very well. Michael is one of those people in the faculty that we all love and admire. In the field that he works, of course, many of us look and go, well, OK, Michael, that's all right for you. Just give us the easy way of doing the things you think about and the way you operate. And you know, in Michael's normal style, very kind, very thoughtful, very understanding, he goes, yeah, I can give you the simple version, John, because that's what you need. But tonight, for you, he will give you the deep, complex, thoughtful version. Because <laughs> he can look at an audience like this and go, oh, I see the people with the intellectual rigour here who can cope with my powerful ideas. Now, I'm not setting him up to be in a difficult situation. I'm simply saying he's a very smart guy and the ideas he's going to put across to you tonight will not be simple. They will be thoughtful, challenging and develop your understanding. And that's what a good teacher does. And Michael is a good teacher and he's also, as an associate professor, an outstanding researcher. Michael's one of our favourites. We love him dearly. I know that what he's going to do with you tonight, you will say at the end, OK, he did deserve to have more than one row in the front like the Dean. <laughs> and he'll probably be counting you on the way out so that he can let me know what the final result was. So I'll hand over to Michael. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Michael, all yours. Great, thank you. <laughs> so that's rather a scary introduction, so I'm, I'll try and be <laughs> deeply simple if I can get away with that. <laughs> but first, I think it's important for acknowledgement of country. Monash University's Australian campuses are proudly on Coolin land in Melbourne. And I acknowledge the traditional owners of this <coughs> land and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. So tonight what I want to do is talk about a deeply simple um, idea I would like to um, first of all say thank you for having me. It's a privilege to be here and, and it's quite daunting. It's also daunting because I think we've got as a makeup <coughs> around about 20 uh, research staff here from Monash, about 40% of students and 40% of teachers. So it's going to be a little bit hard to do a presentation to reach out to all of you, and that's what I'm going to try and do. And along the way, I'm going to try and traverse quite a lot of territory. So I'm not going to cite too many works or show too many numbers. I'm going to try and make some propositions. And tonight, what I'd like to do is propose that technology in education is a wicked problem. And that to productively tackle that wicked problem, we could draw on design methodologies. And one of those design methodologies is design thinking. The problem with design methodologies, however, is that there's a number of inherent flaws. And so I'm going to propose that in addressing those flaws, we could perhaps take a smidgen of playfulness. Ultimately, I'll argue that education, educators and students might more fruitfully be redefined as designers and teaching as design. So a little bit about why I'm here. I was a classroom teacher for 10 years. And across those 10 years, I had this deeply embedded commitment and enthusiasm for the potential of digital technologies for student learning and professional learning. And yet over those 10 years, I was constantly frustrated. And as I worked through the system, became head of department, and I had budgets and everything else that I could sort of uh, lever towards this idea of using technologies for student learning and staff learning. I kept getting these frustrations. Why would some staff not choose to adapt or adopt technologies in their practice? Why are some schools and some departments 
sort of seemingly resistant to the use of some technologies or difficult to change? And why a great lesson with technologies over here just didn't work <coughs> next door? And these kinds of frustrations and challenges after 10 years made me, as it would for all of us, become an academic. So now I've spent almost the same amount of time, nine years and four months, not that I'm counting, uh, researching this problem, trying to figure out what, why, why do we have these frustrations? And so I've traversed quite a lot of territory here as well. I've, I've looked into different technologies like virtual reality, and augmented reality, 3D printing and sort of the maker culture. I've looked at um, feedback principles and cyberbullying, social media, social networking. And I've been looking at this from early childhood through to higher education. And after almost 10 years of research, I've come to this, this irrefutable, this, this complete and utter understanding of what the answer is. The answer is quite simply, there's no answer. It just doesn't work, and that's a cop-out. <laughs> but actually, what it really works out to is that there's no right answer, but there's some that we could say is only right for here and now. And the contextualised and contingent nature of education helps us to explain the, 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 this notion that technologies can't be simply transplanted so easily. So we know that technologies do not fix education. But I think it's an exciting opportunity. I think if we take the assumption that technologies don't fix education despite the discourse around it, then we need to stop looking for that universal design, that research project or that teaching strategy that's around the technology that says this is what worked and this is how it worked and so the assumption is we could just do it over there and it's going to work as well. Let's stop looking for that. And then instead, let's think about, instead of the universal design, looking for or working through the process of design. So what I want to do is just stop for a moment. Because design is inherently this strange creative endeavour. And so I think we should start where we want to finish. So I've got an activity for you. I've got some fantastic elves in the room who are going to hand out this thing called Play-Doh. And I want you to do this strange thing. Grab that um, thing of Play-Doh, and I want you to create something with it. I want you to, first of all, look at the person next to you. You need to look at the person next to you. Now, this is a very strange activity to do. It's very weird. I know, I know, I know. That's why I'm asking you to do it. I want you to look at the person next to you. Look at them in the eyes. It's very weird, very confronting. And now, and now, I want you to create the perfect, not just a, but the perfect hat for them out of the Play-Doh, a hat. Or a fascinator, you know. Yeah, Melbourne Cup is coming up. So I think it's sort of thematic that we should do a hat. Now, this is the perfect hat for the person next to you. Okay, I'm going to put a little bit of music on and I want to see some hats. <laughs> I was like, we, we see some hats, almost the hats are finished. I didn't give you a time, did I? Fantastic. So now that you're getting your hat, what I want you to do is put that hat in your hand. Like that. Put your hat in your hand. I want to see some more hats. And now. I know this is very confronting, I know it's a bit strange. Now what I want you to do is turn to the person you made the hat for and present it to them. You can take it, yes, take it. Okay, so what I want you to do, you can keep that hat, I'm sure, you know. But uh, of course, did any of you reflect on what, it, what uh, that hat might mean about you? Uh, 
there's some deeper re recollections there or deeper thoughts. But okay, so what I want to do is you can put the, you can either keep the hats out or you can put the hats away. We're going to be using Play-Doh again soon. You didn't turn up to this Dean's lecture thinking that we're going to use Play-Doh. Um, okay, so we're going to use that again. But what I want to do now, we've, we've started off with a bit, bit, bit of playfulness. I'm going to come back to a bit of a serious topic here. That, and this is really important. I'm, I'm one of the lead editors for the Australasian Journal of Education Technology, so it's a, it's a pretty good journal. And one of the issues that we come across is the same issue that I, I think teachers come across. And that is this critical problem. We've got a fundamental crisis. We talk too much about what we do with technology and not, too, and not enough about the problem that we're trying to fix or address. Okay? Whenever you go to PD, and I've been to a lot of PD, a lot of uh, professional development days, professional learning days, uh, and both in higher education and um, in schools. And also I read a lot of articles and we have a lot of article submissions. And invariably, well not invariably, but a lot of the time, it's the sharing of practice, but it starts with the technology. It says, hey, I used a wiki. Or I've got this great app. And in research, it's about, hey, I've just applied this wiki to a class and I, I've got you know, reports from 20 students or 2,000 students on how effective this was. And what I, I always come back to the, the issue of what was the purpose? What was the goal? What was the underlying issue that you're trying to address? And it's often hidden. And so long as we are celebrating the technology, we never get to the real issue at heart. Also, so long as we're celebrating the technology, then we're always, as a profession, going to be criticised for reinventing the wheel. Because people are going to be saying, hey, the, this, the problem isn't fixed. Why? You keep saying this, this discourse around technology, this hype, hope and hyperbole. There's a little reference to Neil Selwyn, who talks about hype, hope and disillusionment. So fixating on the solutions and succumbing to technological determinism, this, this idea that we have to use technology, technology will fix things. If we've got a problem, well, it's just the technology is going to have a, have a solution for us. It's only going to mean that we're going to have this sense of failure when the revolution doesn't come. And yet we can never have that rev revolution because technology does not fix things. So in this book, which, which I was very happy to co-edit with, with a good friend, Jeff Romeo, um, and some of the authors are in this room as well. Uh, and in this book, we explored all the different aspects of, of critical issues in education technology, including bring your own device, bring your own technology, flipped classrooms, and social media. And all of these things have got affordances, but they're all complicated. In this book, it reveals the complicated nature of it and how we can't ever say this thing will fix education, or this thing will fix learning. So we've all heard about the hype around social media, that wikis or blogs or social networking sites like Facebook can be these fantastic collaborative sharing spaces and that perhaps we could be using them more as tools in our teaching. Putting aside any kinds of discussions around regulatory or ethical, technical or pedagogical implications, we've got a little bit of a problem in that fundamentally, Students are not stupid. They understand that our education system is at, at its core around individualised assessment. It's about their performance. So when we say, hey, it's fine, use this wiki to be collaborative, and collaborative is more than being cooperative. Collaborative is where you take risks and you're codependent on each other. So stu students know, deep down, culturally, we're in a system that favours individualised performance. So no wonder, straight away, deep down, we have this tension. On one hand, we're saying in the discourse of social media, hey, it's fantastic to teach, it's going to be great for this collaborative e in endeavour, that we can break the boundaries of the classroom walls and the boundaries of the school um, bells. But until we address this underlying concern, we might have a problem. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. So even when, so I'm scratching the microphone there. <laughs> even when, um, 
even when we have that perfect moment in the classroom or in the school, where the technology and the pedagogy, you know, the relationships and how we work with our students just swing. It's just fantastic. Even then, we can't transplant from this location to the next. And research shows us that over and over and over again. I've just spent two days in a symposium with some really big minds in the space of feedback and assessment. And then one of the issues constantly for two days is how can we scale this? How can we make this great, these great ideas and these great practices scale up, scale across institutions? It's an issue that we haven't been able to address. In the case of teacher adoption of, of um, technology, my own research that started back way, way back after those 10 years of frustrations, that's what I looked at to begin with. The, the professional development, how we can sustain it to improve this adoption, this, this adaption, this, this working with technology. And the thing that I came to the conclusion of is that it's more about identity of being as a teacher and understanding that technologies have a role in your practice than simply someone saying, or 20 different ways of someone saying, hey, this is how you could use it or this is the way you should use it. We know in professional learning it's far more complicated than telling. And yet that is the majority of technology focused professional learning. It's button pushing, menu finding, and occasionally some tips and tricks. So the uniqueness of every context simply means that the innovation needs to be redesigned in every school, every classroom, and every professional learning activity. But this is not a problem. It's only a problem if we fixate on the fact that technology should solve things, and it doesn't. But if we change it around saying, well, actually, you know what? This highlights the innovative nature of teachers, that teachers are constantly working to address the problems around them. They're constantly trying to design approaches. So this leads me then to this idea of the wicked problem. So the wicked problem um, is an idea that was uh, pitched many, many years ago, not in education, in social planning. And it, 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 it's basically referring to this idea that a wicked problem is a problem that can never be properly resolved. It can only be sort of resolved over and over again. It's tricksy. It's not sinister of evil. Okay, but it's tricksy. Because every time we make a change or do something in response to a wicked problem, then the situation itself changes. So then we have to change again and again and again. And if we recognise that every time that we add technology, it changes the context, so naturally it will never solve things. So let's stop beating ourselves over the head about it. So the wicked problem for us lies in the sheer complexity of education. And then we add technologies. So how might we deal with the wicked problem? So this is where design comes in for me. I suggest that one way is design, particularly design processes I'm interested in. And one idea around design processes is this thing called design thinking. Design thinking does feature in our curriculum. So in the Australian curriculum, in digital technologies, which I'm particularly focused on, being my space, it is referred to, but only sort of in passing, but it's there. It's also referred to by Aitzel as a potential way that um, professional learning um, schools could approach the problems, or actually approach finding the problems. The problem with design thinking is that um, it's a fractured space. It's come out of uh, design professions. And there's about five discourses around design thinking in those professions. And it's also now, and as a buzzword, it's really coming out of marketing and business. And there's around three discourses there. And sometimes they don't overlap. And so we have this problem of a buzzword. It has something in it. Design is a space which I, I understand and I believe we have an approach. But I caution you that as you go out and explore what design thinking might be and how you might use it, take a large degree of criticality to it, okay? So don't accept just one stance, whether it's IDEO or Stanford or wherever, okay? It can be a lot more fluid than what you might come across. But design is generally an idea that you're familiar with, I would assume. This idea that you sort of come to understand a problem, you ideate, you come up with ideas, you prototype and test, and you cycle through. The problem is, 
However, in schools in particular, we don't get many opportunities to do that iterative cycle sort of nature of design. Whether you're in the English classroom or in a technology classroom, we go through this idea of trying to understand the issue, the problem, the task, and we start coming up with ideas how we might approach it, and we might then start prototyping, drafting, playing out with ideas, testing out those ideas with the peers and with your teacher. And we might start testing and, okay. The problem is, it often becomes a linear process where the testing or the end point is the end point. And we don't get a chance to iterate. And really what happens is that we can so easily fall into this underlying problem of all design discussions, design methodologies underlying it, is this notion of the solution, the end product, product that we release to the world, the latest, <coughs> next best phone device or the next best whatever. But I think we're looking at the wrong thing. It's that messy squiggle that's learning and that's teaching. And that's the bit, if we can observe it, if we can measure it, if we can see how we're iteratively working through the, that mess, then I think we're onto something. So design is messy. So rather than the, cy the cyclical sort of diagram, which makes it all look way too simple, rather than the linear process where there's an end point, what I'd like to suggest is that it needs to be a bit more fluid. And this is the kind of designerly thinking or designerly mindsets that we see from the literature in design professions, where we might move backwards and forwards. Design thinking or design methodologies is probably best approached as a paradigm shift. <laughs> so design thinking though, I have to be really uh, careful about this, it's not a solution, okay? We know there's a number of people, a number of leading figures in the design thinking space, we're still starting to step away from design thinking because of the problem of it being a fractured space, being overly used as a buzzword of the latest, greatest thing that people will say, you're right, let's do a design thinking impression, we will fix the school. I think there's something in there, but it's starting to be, become superficial. So we have to be cautious. Nevertheless, there are things that we can learn from it, such as the mindset. So in design thinking, we might start talking about mindsets, okay, or cultures of thinking. And these are just some. This notion of creative confidence, radical collaboration, empathy, bias towards action, rapid prototyping. When do we use these in our lesson planning? When do we use these in our staff meetings? When do we use these as learners? Not often, because it's hard. So design thinking is more about problem finding than problem solving. As much time in a design thinking approach would be spent on trying to figure out what the problem is. And it's a human-centered approach. So it's all about empathy and discovery. And there's a lot of strategies and procedures and ways that you could be tackling this. So if we come back to the social media issue that I talked about, this underlying tension between the culture of individualized assessment and this language around social media being this lovely collaborative space where students can take risks and be creative, if we actually acknowledge and understand this tension, as some few papers and research papers have done, then strangely enough, when they start to address those issues, such as a very simple strategy of ensuring that the students are aware that their individual contributions and changes are constantly being uh, tracked so that at any point, if needed, recourse can be made. That step alone has been shown to increase the degree of creative risk taking. Because it's recognising that the students are not silly, they understand or they've been at least, they have many years of experience. Even if you're, if you're not engaging in this individualised assessment approach, they have had a lot of years of experience of this. And so at least by acknowledging it, we can then maybe take a few different steps. It's not rocket science, but it's a change of our, of our perspective and understanding where the issues are. Another example is this one, and this goes back a number of years. When I very first came to Monash, actually, this is a project that I started working on. And I love it because it just has this lovely simplicity that started me down the track of going, maybe there's something in this coming together and being a little bit radical together. So there's this language of radical collaboration. This is hardly radical collaboration, but it's a, it's a, it's a indication of what might be. So in this case, Damien was working with other teachers. They'd come together and do almost like a study group. And they talk about their problems in teaching. 
And what they do is they actually bring resources in and they take each other to their classrooms and they step through what they're doing and they talk about particular scenarios. But they try and show and demonstrate rather than simply talk, which is one of the principles of design thinking. In this case, Damien had this point of view statement of saying, how can I stop being the bottleneck of my students trying to get feedback on how they're performing, how they're talking, how they're doing oral performances and, and other kinds of work. And strangely enough, even though he was the technology expert in the school, and uh, the other teachers there, as he explained it and showed them his classroom, they said, hey, why don't you just get your students to record themselves? And eventually they set up a system by which the students could then peer and self-assess. And this is going back nine years, four months. Um, so when we're talking about 170 gigabytes of video, we're talking about something quite startling. And so this teacher then all of a sudden found a different way of working with students through the fact that they was talking to other teachers. And often we know this in professional practice, teachers, we're so siloed. We often work by ourselves. It's, I think it's, it's, uh, it's changing, but we are doing that. So the design process then. So I've mushed up, and that's a technical term, I mushed up a few different design thinking approaches. Uh, so there's some traditions in here because I'm not trying to sell a particular um, approach to you. But the idea is that generally we have this discovery, empathy, the seeking inspiration phase. And you can see these arrows going out and that's the possibility. So that's a divergent phase where we're starting to say, well, what's the idea? What's the possibilities here? What could we be doing? Um, and then interpreting it. So taking all that information from the radical collaboration, from that divergent thinking, saying, well, okay, what is the problem? What underlying, un underlying all this? What, what kinds of things could we be working on? And then we ideate. We start saying, okay, well, let's start being creative again about the different ways that we could approach it. And then we come back again to the less ideas in terms of experimenting, prototyping, testing out. And then we evolve it. It never finishes. It, there's, there's no point where you come in without knowing things, without already biases. And at the end of the day, it's an ongoing iterative space. And that's the beautiful thing about teaching, unlike marketing and product research and other kinds of things, that we're constantly teaching that class the next week and then the next week, or we're teaching that lesson the next year. Okay, so we know this is iterative, this is ongoing, this is career. And so why do we approach it as if, ah, this is the end point? So I think we have a nice difference from traditional design approaches. So design thinking requires the social and the individual, the divergent and convergent. And we're gonna play with that in a little bit. I wanna talk about divergent thinking. Um, it's something that we don't do enough in the social, in schools and in higher education um, and in classrooms. Divergent thinking is a bit problematic though for us as teachers, I think, because we're, we are constrained. We're constrained by the language, okay, the symbols that we use to understand the world. We are inside a box, and it's very hard to step outside of that box. So how do we expect to come to the next best idea that's going to break the mould when we're already locked into a mould of a sort? We're also risk averse as a profession, for quite rightly so, there's so many risks that we take on a day-to-day -day basis. Every decision that we make is in a grey space as teachers. So to take larger risks with strategies and approaches and bending the rules and trying things out. We're also or orientated to the pragmatic. I love working with teachers because we are pragmatic. If you see something wrong, you fix it. In other kinds of meetings I go to where some chairs are in the wrong place, they'll call a committee or call someone to go fix it. Teachers will say, oh, just move the whole room around. We're very pragmatic, but we're also time orientated and we're under pressure. So of course, if we're saying, let's be divergent, let's spend as long on figuring out the problem as figuring out a way to move forward, then straight away we're working against the underlying culture of schools. Okay, here's a warm up exercise, then we're gonna talk a little bit more about divergent thinking. So this is in teams of two to three. You're going to use your Play-Doh again. And this is a very classic, this is a classic strategy of warming up divergent thinking uh, sort of approaches. 
What we need to do is get you stuck. And the best way to get you stuck is to try and get you to do as many things as possible, and many ideas as possible about your play doing. So, how many ways or how many things could you use your Play-Doh for, apart from being Play-Doh? Okay? Now what I want you to do, if you have a device, if you don't, that's okay. Maybe someone next to you will have a device, because we're going to be looking at these answers. There's a little hyperlink there, and you can just pop that into your phone or, or whatever. And I want you to type in all the different uses that you can use with your Play-Doh. Okay? So, here's, a, here's another trick with it. You have to demonstrate it. You can't talk. Oh, well you, can, you can sort of talk a little bit, but I mean, you have to demonstrate it. You can't, you, can't just say, you can't just say, oh, it's this, this, and this, and write them down. You have to actually demonstrate it, and then you can make a note of it, okay? Right? So you have to demonstrate it. I know it's weird exercise, but go to it. Okay, so there you go. So you got the task. Type in all the different possible uses. I want as many as possible. Stay on task and demonstrate. Divergent exercises, you've got to listen to when people start to dull down or they start going off topic, and you need to give a prompt. Okay, like anything in teaching, you need to wait for the moment. So here's a moment. I started to hear that you, some of you are going off topic. So I'll give you a bit of a prompt. What if that Play Doh was a lot larger, it was stronger, the world was invaded? What could you use it for? My favourite was if it had an arch rival, or perhaps if Lady Gaga owned it. What could be done with that Play-Doh? I want some creative thinking. Get stuck and then get unstuck. Go for it. Just another minute. I want more ideas. So let's see how creative you were. I noticed there wasn't a lot of devices here. I often do talk to ed tech crowds and they're usually out with the devices and I usually have to give them these exercises so they stop tweeting about me and actually tweeting for me. But um, let's see how creative you were. What we've got is a quite a few different ideas. That was just a warm up. Here's the real endeavor. Okay. So I'll take to get that out of the way. Okay. So what I want to do is, if anything, you walk away from this lecture and you, you're thinking, mm, I'm not so sure about design thinking, I'm not so sure about this idea that maybe we should be thinking about design, at least you can walk away with a few strategies for your classroom. So here's a strategy around brainstorming. It's coming out of you know, uh, creative confidence research. So brainstorming, let's talk about it. Talkative colleagues can monopolise. We understand that. Pragmatic colleagues can discourage. They've already skipped to the implementation phase. Early ideas tend to be picked. So if you're one of those people like me that sits back in the classroom and tries to be wise, or you know, in a meeting or something, be wise and just sort of wait till the end before I drop in my beautiful pearl of wisdom because my idea is going to trump everyone else's and they're going to choose my idea in this brainstorming exercise, then statistically you're wrong. Statistically, the first ideas are the ones that get picked. A few really obvious answer, uh, uh, reasons for that. One is probably the least controversial, it's the safest, most conservative. Okay? And it's the one that people mostly will negotiate back to, the fastest. So if you want your idea to be picked, jump in there early. <laughs> um, individuals, strange enough, despite general thoughts around brainstorming, individuals can create uh, much more quality and quantity on their own. 
But again, they're limited to the box that they're working with and their symbolic um, you know, uh, language that they're working with. So the groups need to be or should be diverse and constantly changing. There's some brainstorming rules that you can take away if you don't know them already. So I want you to defer judgment. I want you to encourage wild ideas. Deal with the constraints later. Don't ever say but. Use the word and. Okay? Stay focused on topic, one conversation at a time because if you're both talking and you're not listening. Be visual, go for quantity. Normally at this stage I'd start to get you to draw things. There's another aspect of design processes is to be visual. Okay, and so we've already been playing with the idea of the, the play zone being sort of more physical about it. So what I want you to do though, even if you don't get to the point of being visual, which I really sort of would be, it'd be nice if you could, is I want you to tackle this task. How might we find a needle in a haystack? Now this person is one of my favourite people in the whole wide world. Um, in November the 15th, 2014, Sven, did this art performance based on the expression looking for a needle in a haystack. I don't really get um, performance art too much, but I love this. This whole idea that he got someone to pay for him to spend a week going through hay looking for a needle. I mean, it's a dangerous occupation, isn't it? But he got paid to do this. I think this is fantastic. Um, anyway, I want you to do this. I want you to figure out how might we find a needle in the haystack. I, w I would normally ask you, say, if you've got paper, that's definitely the way to go. And we have paper here and pencils if you don't um, uh, have any and you want to use some. And I know it's really tempting just to sit there and chat, but remember that's going against what I'm trying to get you to experience. So if any time to experience this stuff, it's now. Okay, so get the paper out, even if you're a bit tired, do it. I want you to work together to figure out how we can find the needle in that haystack. Okay, you got a minute or so. Start talking. <laughs> okay. Right. So let's find out what some of your ideas were. Okay. So we've got some fantastic diagrams going through. When you do this, so we're going to break the rules here a little bit because we don't normally do design thinking with such a large group. Okay. What I would normally suggest is one way to approach this is you do that you take the drawing and you hand it to someone who wasn't part of your group don't say a word get them to try and talk through what they're seeing because you never know what gem drops out and that's where you can do this radical collaboration through visual media okay so but here what we're going to do i just want to find out what you what you've come up with was there some way too big a smile uh, I don't know where it's going to happen. So who wants to have a go uh, first? Tell us. So we re redefined the problem. That you didn't say anything about it. We do a, did a picture, and the haystack then had an orange knitting needle, the biggest, one we, biggest one we could find in the top, and it was radioactive, so we could find it with a guide character. <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Okay. Changing the rules. That's good. I like that. That's creative thinking. Fantastic. Um, anyone else? Wind machine. A wind machine. Fantastic. Flowing the highway until you eventually find that needle. Okay, okay. Strong magnet, fantastic. I set it on fire, fantastic. Here we go. Lovely. Float the straw on water and the needle might sink. Now, you know, you, you are all pretty conservative. Because I've, had this act I've done this activity a few times. I want to hear something more uh, interesting avenues. I, I know they're out there. Um, I was just read a two metre long needle. A two metre long needle? Yeah. I love it, okay. 
So in the past, I've had a, often a bunch of biology people and they'll say something on the lines of, let's get a cow to eat the hay and then they can have the... <laughs> oh, okay, you're all just a bit... You're just being a little bit too polite to give us these ideas. Okay. And, um, you know, I've had a few uh, junior school teachers and they've said, just get the kids to do it. Um, so, oh, I said a couple nods there as well. So what you're all doing is just being really polite here. Okay. So, look, these kinds of exercises help us to build up creative confidence, okay? And the, the funny thing is, we don't do it often enough. And isn't it funny when in the classroom we say to our students, right, brainstorm time. And we expect great things to come out of it. And yet all the research, I can tell you, all the research is saying, it's hard stuff to be divergent. It's harder to be divergent thinking in groups with peers and it's just something you need to practice. How many hours of brainstorming practice do you think you've had in the last year? Does it add up to hours? Well, we need a lot more than that to be really proficient at it. So the research says. Okay. So um, I got some interesting uh, pictures here on, on uh, Twitter of all your uh, pictures, but we'll just for the sake of time push on. So being creative is hard. This is another part of my research. And actually, um, this, is, this is coming out of um, some work I had, I had with a fantastic um, master's student who did some research around creative uh, thinking and risk-taking in design. And it fascinated me so much that I've been going down it a little bit further. And the thing that fascinates me is this idea of risk-taking. It turns out that risk-taking is an essential characteristic of all the definitions. It not, might not, actually be called risk in the definition, right? But it is an essential component of all the definitions of creativity. What's more, risk-taking is this idea of a state of uncertainty and that we're invested in it. It's not just that, oh, it could go wrong, so it's fine. It's risk is when it could go wrong. You're not sure about how it's going to come out and you're invested in it, some, and you know, it means something to you. So if we're saying we want students, and you know, the curriculum is saying we want students to be creative, then we need them to take risks. And it has to mean something. And how do we do that? Funnily enough, <laughs> funnily enough, um, the high stakes of the classroom means that we're risk averse, both teachers and students. And so fundamentally, this is the kind of thing that I'm getting to now in my work, of going, what does that mean? If we're risk averse because of the nature of our schooling system, then how can we tackle this very wicked problem? And for me, technologies <coughs> always fit into the picture. That's who I am. And so I'm looking at how technologies can play in that role. Both both making us more of us because it's reifying our identities. Whenever we do something in a social media site or into a discussion forum or something, it puts it out there who we are and all our uh, faults for everyone to see, even if it's just within our classroom. But also how we can work with teachers in this space. So unsurprisingly, <laughs> um, risk taking does require trust. and so. The work that um, my student Tim Casamati um, has done, he was looking at, at this stuff and, um, and really it became very obvious to him in his work that when teachers were confident and were able to be playful with the curriculum structures, the school structures and confident with the technologies, you know this idea that we say teachers don't need to know which buttons to press, the kids can do it. Well, it doesn't quite work out that way. You need to have enough confidence to know it's okay to play, even if you don't know which buttons. You need to have confidence to know what's going to be an acceptable risk and an acceptable outcome. And in terms of creativity, at the end of the day, we are the gatekeepers, because unless we can actually recognise the creativity, we're not going to be awarding it. Okay? So we have a lot of risks, and it means that as much of a risk that we're asking our students to take, teachers have to take that as well. <coughs> okay. So, bringing technology to bear. 
I'd say it's a wicked problem. Every time we bring technology into the classroom, into the school system, it just means an extra layer of complexity. That's not a bad thing. But let's stop pretending that it's a solution. Let's stop thinking that it's going to fix all of our problems. I think our task is to build this creative confidence, to take risks. The problem with design thinking is that it tends to always underlying, say we're working towards a solution, an end product. And what I'd say to you is stop, th stop thinking of that end product, start thinking more playfully about what we could be doing in our problem finding. Now I don't know if this is true or not, okay, but um, <laughs> when a reporter asked Edison, how did it feel to fail a thousand times? Edison replied, I didn't fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention with a thousand steps. I don't know if that's a true quote. You know, you have all these quotes on the internet. You can't believe everything you read. But it's so good, I thought I'd use it anyway. So what I'd like to challenge you with is three questions. Okay? What would happen if technologies were no longer thought of as solutions? If we broke through that horrible discourse that we have in administration, in budget, in, in politics, in schools, and the language that we use with each other where we celebrate the technology, not the problem. What happens if we adopted a design mindset, this creative confidence, this risk taking, this uh, problem finding approach as opposed to solution finding? And what would happen if we started thinking of teaching as design? And I've come to this idea that for me, answering those questions is this. You need to embrace the fail, folks. We need to take those risks. But all the way along, as I've been saying, we have this culture, we have these problems of the time, the pressure, the curriculum, the risk adverse nature of the context in which we work and learn. But that doesn't mean to say we can't dream. I think teaching needs to be thought of as design and teachers as designers. So thank you very much. So again, Michael, thank okay. you very thank much. You. Wonderful evening. Much appreciated.